What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Engelman for Awesomeo.com, and I'm going to take a look at this Saturday's UFC 241, Daniel Cormier versus Stipe Miocic 2. Really excited about this card. It's the best card we've had in uh, a couple weeks, that's for sure. Lots of fun fights at the top that I'm going to get started with. But first, if you want to sign up at Awesomeo.com, head to Awesomeo.com slash join. You can use the promo code KNOCKOUT for 50% off your first month with us. Any monthly package at all, it doesn't just have to be anything about MMA. Any monthly package you choose, including packages that include Fantasy Cruncher, you can use the promo code KNOCKOUT and get 50% off. I'm going to take a look at the three main fights of the card and a couple fighters that I have my eye on. So let's dig in. Here we go. So we're looking at a 12 fight fight card five fights on the main card we've got uh four fights on the regular prelims three fights on the early prelims um i'm going to touch on the cormier miocic fight the pettis diaz fight and the yoel romero paulo costa fight um do want to give a little bit of a shout out right now i don't touch on it later but uh derek brunson originally from wilmington north carolina where i have made my home for the past decade will be pulling for derek in that one uh Got a tough fight, but um, we'll be pulling for him there. On the prelims, we've got Devontae Smith. Uh, we've got a, an awesome Rafael Asuncao, Corey Sanhagen fight. Uh, Drakkar Close's odds are tumbling a little bit compared to when I wrote my original article. So I mean, I'm interested to see where he ends up, ends up as we uh, get closer to lineup lock tomorrow. Early prelims, I don't have a ton of interest in, although Hannah Cyphers is... Uh, certainly a large favorite and worth looking at. Not a lot, though, on the early prelims that I have my eye on, but let's dig into some of these fights on the main card. We probably want to take a look first at the odds of a finish. So what you'll see on the right-hand side in... Well, you can't see me pointing, but that general area. Uh, that is every fighter, along with their odds of winning this fight inside of distance, a.k.a. a finish. As of right now, Devontae Smith greatly outpacing the rest of the card. 76% chance to pick up a finish in his fight. There's a reason he's the most expensive fighter today. Yoel Romero coming in second. Uh, Sadiq Youssef coming in third. Cormier's look good. Stipe's look good. Um, Manny Bermudez has some decent odds for someone that's not going to get talked about a lot. But what you're looking at, full graphical representation of each fighter's odds of picking up a finish. Um, this is a stat and, uh, these are odds that I like to look at quite a bit when choosing my lineups. Uh, if I can get people that finish their fights early, I am likely to get a decent chunk of points as well. So check this stuff out. Uh, it's probably my favorite single piece of information to look at. Um, so if you're ever looking into MMA odds, odds of winning inside a distance, certainly something to look at. We're starting anywhere. We're starting with the main event. Daniel Cormier, Stipe Miocic. This is their second fight. This is the first time that uh, Stipe is going to be in the cage since losing that fight and the title to Cormier about a year ago. Cormier coming in, uh, the slight favorite, 56% chance to win. Uh, it's got a 41% chance to win this fight inside a distance. Stipe just a little hair behind that. Uh, you can see Cormier a little bit more expensive as evidenced by those odds. It's a hell of a fight. I mean, Cormier is now 40. He had claimed to be retired at this point. He is taking this fight. If he wins, is he done? Does he look for the third John Jones fight? Does he try to fight Francis Ngannou, who is probably next in line? That's a scary fight for him. I don't really know what Cormier is going to do here. Uh, it might not all. It might not matter because we've got Stipe on the other side. He is the only heavyweight in UFC history to defend that heavyweight title three times. He looked good in the beginning of the fight against Cormier a year ago. Um, they landed comparable amounts of significant strikes until Cormier caught him and Stipe went to sleep. I am leaning more towards Stipe in this fight. Uh, at some point in time, age will catch up to everybody. And, you know, I think that Stipe is one of the best heavyweights of all time. Not that Daniel Cormier isn't, but 
at 40 years old, it starts to get a little bit more difficult and we won't see that it's gone until it's gone. Uh, because of the salary 7,700, I can't imagine not wanting to have high amounts of Stipe. I still like Cormier at 8,500. It would surprise me if I didn't have one of each of these guys in every single lineup that I put out. Um, I'm leaning towards Stipe right now. I assume that if he wins, it's another date with Francis Ngannou unless John Jones comes up. If it's a close fight, I could see running back the cormier Stepe trilogy, but I don't really know how interesting that's going to be. For me personally, I'll have more Stepe than I will Cormier. This fight can go either direction. We are talking about two of the greatest heavyweights that have ever stepped into the octagon. This is such an awesome actual fight. I'm not so sure I love it from a DFS perspective, but Anthony Pettis, second fight at welterweight, coming off of a just brutal KO, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Certainly not uh, the expectation in that fight whatsoever. Uh, I mean, if Pettis was going to finish him, I would have expected it to happen via submission. Uh, Pettis has no problem submitting basically anybody from any angle. 8,300 here, uh, slight favorite to win the fight, not really big finish odds, which shouldn't be terribly surprising. A three round fight against someone like Nate Diaz, you know, you, you don't finish Nate Diaz all that often. Um, I like Pettis. I assume that Anthony Pettis wins this fight and then goes on to do, I don't know what, or hey, Masvidal, Conor McGregor. I don't really know where Pettis goes after this off of a victory, but I, it, it's some sort of money fight. Um, I think he's just the better fighter at this point, more active. Nate's time away is certainly not going to help, but boy, oh boy, am I excited to watch him get back in there. $7,900 for Diaz, uh, just a slight underdog, similar odds to finish the fight. Again, it's not like Pettis gets finished all that often, particularly in a three-rounder. Diaz is more going to be a volume guy. I'd be surprised if either one of these guys gets caught in submissions. Um, a more likely to go to Diaz in comparison to Pettis. Uh, this is a good fight for Nate. His biggest issue is generally going to be, and actually similar to Pettis, they're both of these guys' biggest issues is going to be guys that want to put them on their back, uh, wrestlers that are only looking to wrestle. I expect these guys to go out there and have what amounts to a kickboxing fight for 15 minutes, which is fine. The volume will be there for Nate. The volume has never really been there for Pettis. Um, it just not going to crank out a lot of significant strikes on a per minute basis. Whereas Nate, if he gets cooking, uh, he could really put the stats together. So Nate, someone I like a little bit more in cash games, no problem going to GPPs, but we'll see where he ends up in our ownership projections. Uh, this is more, more than anything. It's just a fight that I want to watch. Uh, if Nate wins this fight, uh, I think the outcome is pretty similar to if, Pettis does. I think we either see the trilogy fight with Conor McGregor or we possibly see Nate uh, get in there with Jorge Masvidal if Masvidal isn't going to get in there with Leon Edwards. We assume that we're going to be seeing uh, Kamaru Usman and Colby Covington now, which kind of leaves uh, Masvidal on the outside looking in. I like either one of these guys in that spot against Masvidal if he doesn't get the Leon Edwards fight, but while I don't love this as a DFS fight, I cannot imagine doing anything other than uh, focusing with both eyes wide open when this one starts Saturday night. Great, great fight. Incredible storyline. Just super fun. The last fight I'm taking a look at on the main card is a doozy. Uh, this might be the battle for the best body in the UFC. Um, I mean, these guys are just shredded genetic freaks yoel romero paulo costa uh romero at 8600 costa at 7600 romero slight favorite uh significantly better odds to win this fight inside a distance uh, i i greatly prefer romero here i mean he's been in two absolute wars with robert whitaker he has a much 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 higher uh, strength of schedule, so to speak, compared to Costa. Um, Romero hasn't been in the cage since the split decision loss um, to Whitaker. 
to me, he's just a better fighter than Paulo Costa. And he has been able to show that in the UFC for his entire UFC career. Um, you know, I thought he dropped the Jacare decision. He got the nod there. But ultimately, I mean, this is a guy that just doesn't lose. He's dropped both fights to to Whitaker, and he lost to uh, Fei Zhao, I believe, in his Strike Force debut. God, it feels like a lifetime ago now. Um, those 47% odds to finish, really interesting to me. Um, I think I think Paulo Costa is getting a little bit too much too soon. I don't think he is ready for this sort of jump up in competition. Or the, the odds say otherwise. Now, this is, again, another spot where Father Time uh, could be creeping up to Yoel Romero. He is 42 years old. He's older than Daniel Cormier. Uh, you wouldn't know that by looking at him. Um, so, you know, the youth is certainly on, on Costa's side. I just, I don't think he has the skill set outside of just flat finishing Romero um, to get this done. Romero, clearly, Romero, the better grappler. Um, one of the best wrestlers in basically the history of the UFC. And given his stature, I mean, it might be him and Cejudo as the best that have ever done it to compete also at a high level in the cage. Um, I think Romero gets the finish here. Not entirely sure where he goes after this. Uh, he'll certainly be one of the first guys in line if... Israel Adesanya is able to take out Robert Whitaker, but if Whitaker wins, um, you know Romero's going to have to get in line. I expect him to win here, although the odds are closer. I think I might be looking at a Yoel Romero bet for this Saturday. Um, I like Romero a lot in both cash games and GPPs. He's a guy I'm going to have heavy exposure to. I don't mind getting some Paulo Costa at 7,600 in GPPs just because that's a big finish rate. Uh, but I am not as confident in his ability to finish Yoel Romero. He could be there in the future after Romero is long gone from um, the UFC. I just don't think this is a good fight for him. Now, there are a couple other guys I think that you should keep your eye on for this card. At the beginning, I mentioned Devontae Smith. Most expensive fighter on the card, 9,500. He's got an 85% chance to win his fight. He's got a 76% chance to win this fight inside of distance. He was originally supposed to fight uh, John McDessey. McDessey had to pull out. He was originally going to be then fighting uh, Clay Collard. Uh, Collard pulled out a couple days ago. So now um, he is on his third opponent. Short notice, uh, I expect Smith to go out there, put a beating on him, blast him. A first round finish is the most likely scenario here. And uh, you're going to get what you pay for, I think. 9500 is a lot. It's interesting, though, because I think there are, is a lot of value in the high eights and low eights so that getting to someone like Smith is a bit easier than it normally is. You don't have to go all the way to the bottom of the barrel to do it. Really hard to ignore him. Now, Corey Sandhagen, different kind of fight. He's got uh, Rafael Asuncao. Uh, Asuncao has basically been a stalwart of the bantamweight division for you know, the, its entire existence uh, before getting choked out by Marlon Moraes. He only had a loss over seven years, I believe, to TJ Dillashaw, a man who he also beat. You know, decision, slightly controversial, but still. The only loss was a decision to TJ prior to getting choked out by Marlon Moraes. Um, this is a big-time fight and a big-time step up for Corey Sanhagen. Uh Sanhagen got the nod in his last fight out against John Lineker, split decision. And uh, per MMA decisions, I, I mean, the, the media was legit split on that card. So, you know, while he did get the win and it propelled him to this fight, which will be, you know, potentially a fight to get him into a number one contender matchup after this, you know, he could be looking at someone like Aljamain Sterling, uh, you know, number one contender fight after Cejudo gets to fight wherever, you know, at flyweight, at bantamweight, if he tries to fight Shevchenko and uh, Amanda Nunes together, whatever he wants to do. Um, I'm just, I have my eye on Sandhagen here because I think he's quite the prospect in the bantamweight division. 64% chance to beat a Sun Sao. Uh, that's a bigger number than I would have expected. 
uh, for someone with sort of a Sun Tzu's pedigree in the UFC. Only 22% to get the finish, which doesn't surprise me. In a three-round fight, you know, Rafael Asuncao is not exactly getting finished all that often. I like Sanhagen. Um, I'm not sure he's going to be able to pay off 8700 uh, in a decision win. So he's not a guy that I'm looking to big time in GPPs, but I like the idea of going to him in a cash game. And then finally, uh, Sadiq Yusuf, uh, 9,300. He's the second biggest favorite on the card. Third highest odds of picking up a finish. Um, I like he's just going to go out there and bang. He got two knockdowns in his last fight, landed 146 significant strikes in 15 uh, minutes against Shaman Moraes. Um, and I see no reason why he doesn't do something similar. If he doesn't get that immediate finish, he has shown the ability to strike in volume over 15 minutes. I think that he can pay off his salary in more than one way. That makes him very interesting to me in a cash game scenario where if he doesn't catch him and doesn't get that finish, and you know, 55% of the time he's not going to get that finish, uh, he can still get there based on landing 100-plus significant strikes over 15 minutes. So Yusef is a guy that I am watching very closely. All right, everybody, that is all I have got. That is the breakdown for UFC 241. Um, if you're interested in checking out more, we have projections and ownership projections uh, behind the paywall at awesomeo.com. If you want to check us out, go to awesomeo.com slash join. Use the promo code knockout. You can get 50% off your first month with us. Follow us on Twitter at awesomeo underscore com. Follow me on Twitter um, at Josh Engelman. If you have any questions about our MMA product or about our products in general, don't be afraid to reach out. Support at awesomeo.com. Uh, tomorrow morning, once we have our ownership projections out, uh, I will be adding a cheat sheet to the article that was posted yesterday, which you may or may not be finding this video in right now. Um, I will be uh, singling out my five best plays of the day in a couple different salary tiers. I'll mark some guys down for G as GPP plays, some guys as cash plays, but I'll give you some building blocks to this Saturday's pay-per-view card, which I could not be more excited about. I will be sweating out the entire card in our premium Slack chat uh, from the time it starts till the time it ends. So if you are a member, join us in the premium MMA channel. If you are not, again, the promo code is knockout. Head to awesomeo.com to join. Best of luck on UFC 241.